Actually, uh, Jeff, before you switch to my screen, can you put that, um, the slide up from that last, that, the last part of that song? I know I'm throwing a curveball at you. There we go. Um, right, I've never known a love like yours. I was thinking about that as we were singing this song coming into tra to transition, just how amazing it is when we can stop and, and truly fathom the love of God. See, the reality is that's actually what we're, what we're talking about today. If you could now switch to my screen. When, I was, when we started thinking about this, this sermon series way back when, um, right, I was praying through, I knew I had a couple opportunities to share, and I wanted it to be the story of God intersecting with the story of Tim. And, and a few weeks ago, you heard my story with the word with, right, and the things that I shared but for many of us, there might be more than just one theme or one track or one main um, artery, if you will, of our life story. And so definitely with and the abandonment I talked about was one. Um, so luckily I was granted two Sundays, though there's actually three strands. So um, you'll have to wonder forever what the third one is. But the second one um, in my story really comes down to this, that it's a love story. That my story, the reality is that um, it's a love story. You see, when my parents were so busy working, um, as I talked about, if you're here with the whole Kentucky Fried Chicken thing and I never saw them, one of the things that that communicated to me that I would find out wrongly, but as a 5, 6, 10, 11-year-old, I could only interpret it the way I could at my age, was that my parents don't love me. And so love, and the lack thereof, my understanding as a kid through elementary school, um, was another central theme. I can remember, um, right, so don't freak out about this, right? But when you're in grade school and it's Valentine's Day and, and you have to bring a card for everybody, right? And some of those cards would say, hey, Tim, you're great, whatever. But then there would be like one or two, usually from the girls, because in the early 70s, guys weren't so emotive yet. And it would say like, love whoever. And I'm like, oh, love, like she loves me. Because I was so starving as a kid for love. Like, that, that silly, like, redundant card that was probably, like, the same thing to every guy and girl meant the world to me. Because I interpreted abandonment or what they were busy working all the time as, I don't love you. And so as I thought about that and thought about the second um, sermon that I would give in this um, storytelling series, that was... Um, that was what came to my heart. Um, the third one, and unless someone calls in sick, not Sunday, because I'm out of town next weekend, um, for my birthday. Send a card. You can say love. Um, but um, <laughs> is forgiveness, right? So if I had a third Sunday, there you go. So now you fully know all of my issues as a kid that would have saved me so much money in counseling. Where were you 25 years ago, right? But it's a love story, right? And it's a love story so different, right? I've never known a love like this. It's not the love story that Taylor Swift sings about. Though I've heard that song in my mind many times with my daughters. I know some lyrics. But anyhow, um, but it is. Better than the movie in the 70s, early 80s. Um, it's a love story. You see, the reality is that, that love is a part of who God is, and we're going to talk about that. It's also what God does, and it's really the motivation of why God does what God does. And so as I think about his story and my story colliding, that's what we're going to look at today. Um, and so as I was praying about that, um, again, going back to, you know, thinking of the story, you know, from an arc, or, you know, from the, the, the meta story, the, the big story, right? So I kind of go back to the earlier sections of the Bible, right, of the love letter to us out of Exodus, Right here, God is having this ongoing conversation, which he has been having with Moses for some time. Um, and in, in Exodus 34, it says, the Lord came down in the cloud, like right after he did the Ten Commandments thing the first time. Um, and he stood there with him, Moses, and he proclaimed his name, the Lord, Yahweh. And he passed in front of Moses and as he proclaimed his name, he also explained what his name means. Because this is the definition of his name. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. 
that in this conversation with Moses, he's making two key declarations. First, he's revealing his name. And in that culture and in many cultures, um, name meant everything. Which is why, press pause, when you fast forward to the New Testament and, 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 um, and, and uh, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you, if you call somebody a fool, right? If you mess with their name, like their name meant a lot when their parents named them. Like you're, you're really attacking them at their core. Their name meant the core of who they are. It was intentional on the names that were given. And this is the personal name of God, Yahweh. And it means the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's loyal. And so here God is revealing his name. He's revealing some intimacy about himself. But he's also starting to reveal and clarify a little bit about his character and who he is. And so he's talking with Moses. This is my name and this is what it means. But this is who I am. And he would go on to say this. That that love is maintaining love to thousands of generations and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not let the guilty go unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. And one of the things that come, there's a couple things that come out of here, but one is that, yes, God is love. And there's a, there's a very profound scripture in the New Testament where John, writing letters to the church, says God is love. But God is not only love. It is a key attribute of God, but he's made up of many attributes. God is, ho- is love. God is just. God is holy. God is righteous. God is immutable. He does not change. God is sovereign. God is all-knowing. God is all-present. Right? And all of these attributes work in tandem together. And sometimes we, we fail to forget that. And so as I was thinking about that in this, this scripture here, um, it comes out. Because he does not let the guilty go unpunished. But look at the comparison that's there. His love is expressed to thousands of generations versus the, the punishment or the judgment, which is different from discipline, to only a few generations. And if we were to have read Exodus back in 20 in the Ten Commandments when he's giving them out, we see that the heart of the matter of what he's talking about in that le- end of that verse there is, is a hatred. That if these people hate me, then they will be punished. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, it says here, the children and their children, and sometimes we pass on the wrong information to our kids, which is why it's so important for us to raise our kids up right. But it's, it's quite possible that these parents were teaching the same hatred or rebellion they had about God to their children. But yet he says, their punishment goes for a few generations, but my mercy goes for thousands. It's the love of God. Even in his judgment, it's still mixed with some love. And actually, in Deuteronomy 24, that Moses would also clarify that each person, the father and the son, are, are judged according to their own sin. Right? It's not that my dad sinned. It's just I happen to learn from him. As you've seen, maybe, we continue the same things until the chain is broken. And so God also reveals he is just. And then as I was thinking about that, this is one of my favorite verses, right? So that, that, that's talking about the revelation of God, of self-revelation about who he is and what he does. And I love this verse from Jeremiah 31 because to me this speaks to the heart of God, kind of the why of God, the motivation of God. It says, The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with everlasting kindness or unfailing kindness. Right? There's, a, there's a poem that was written a, a couple decades or a, a, I lack sleep because I did not sleep last night. So if I get stuck here, you have to help me. Um, but like in the 1800s, whatever that's called, millennium, decades, long time ago, right? There was a, um, yeah, I'm that tired. Um, there was a poem that was published called The Hound of Heaven. And it was, and it was this, this Englishman's um, interaction with understanding God and writing this. And, and that's what I think about God. He's the hound of heaven. He's relentless. He pursues us. It's what Jesus would say later on, that no one comes to the Father unless, the, unless he draws him. 
God is in the work of bringing people to himself all the time. And it's motivated by love. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It's loyal. It's faithful. It's that Hesed love that we talked about, that Laura brought up a month ago. It's that unfailing love that has no end. And he pursues us. He pursues us. He pursues us. And he does so with the desire that we would love him back. But to me, the, to hear that spoken word from God is huge. In my, in my story, um, there was an issue with my grandfather on my mom's side when I was young. And he said something that, again, I interpreted it my way as a 12 or 13-year-old. And what I heard was, I don't love you, right? And being the second oldest grandson, um, always, I, I, I've always, not always, I used to. We fixed it. Um, for a very long time, I was very competitive with my older brother for the simple fact that he was born first, I was born second in the pecking order, and there was nothing I could do other than take him out um, to, uh, to fix that. And my grandfather was very clear on the number one is the best, and number two is who? And then the third one was my, was my cousin, the first granddaughter, and so I'm kind of like lost in space in there, right? So um, I was waiting all my life for my grandfather to say, I love you. And it, bringing in the theme of forgiveness, one time I, I went to him and I owned my junk as a kid and I was hoping to hear those words from him. And he said, oh, thank you. It wasn't until his 80th birthday, a couple years before he died, that we had a surprise party for him. And he sat me down on the couch next to him and we're looking through a, um, we all made like a photo um, album pages that would go in to a scrapbook. And he was looking at my family's, right? So we, we provided our five or six pages, everybody pitched in. And he was going through that, and then with tears welling up, he looked at me, he said, do you, do you know I, I have always loved you? But you're wired so different from me, I didn't know how to speak your language, but I have never not loved you. Like right there, like Jesus could have returned, like it would have been phenomenal. And I'm like, ah, oh, it was amazing. We had about three or four years after that before he would die that I'm like, I... I mean, I, I should have, I did know it before, right? But now I really know it. But I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I've drawn you with unfailing kindness. It's the words of God to us. And see, one of the realities was God loves his people. Sometimes his people, maybe they love him, maybe they don't. Sometimes we're very disobedient. So when we're disobedient, what is, it says God has to discipline us. And when we went through Hebrews, we look at this. God disciplines on purpose for the purpose of, uh, of correcting us. And it's done in love. But he corrects and he loves and he disciplines as a father would to a child. And so here you have in Lamentations, Jeremiah writing this in the, with the, the backdrop of being in exile and going, getting ready to go to exile. Seventy years of time out that was about to face Israel. And the prophet writes this, I remember my afflictions, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them well. And yet my soul is downcast within me. But yet I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. That because of God's great love, we are not consumed. We're disciplined, we are not consumed. For they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I will say to the Lord, he is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. For the Lord is good for those who hope in him. To the one who waits in him. And it is good to wait for the salvation of the Lord. And the prophet's writing that knowing that they're about to go into timeout and they're going into timeout. And he's going into exile, and he's telling the people, preparing the people, go into exile, don't fight it, but be going with hope, knowing that God will be faithful to bring you back out of it. And great is his faithfulness, it never ends. Every day is a day of more mercy. That as we go into a time of discipline, when we are disobedient, God in his love and his mercy and his faithfulness corrects us and grows us and deals with us, not, not letting go of us. 
And I love that verse. I need that so many mornings when I wake up and I, and I grab my cup of coffee. And I'm like, God, thank you for the gift of another day. Because it's kind of like Groundhog's Day, right? Mistakes I made yesterday, not going to make them today. Because I remember the day before, right? So, um, yeah. But it's all because it's a love story. It's God's love story with us, to us, for us. He includes us. That regardless of the struggles we go through and he has to discipline us, he does so in love. That took me a long time to understand. Not only with my own parents, more so after the fact of reading back into it, but with God. Because you take that love with with, and it's him correcting me and disciplining me, but not leaving me alone in that. Explaining this is why I have to do this, right? If there was that phrase, I don't know that I've ever used it with my kids, but right back in the day, right? This is going to hurt me more than it hurts. Yeah. You don't think God feels that? You know, patient, and he waited time after time, sent messenger after messenger to keep this from happening, but they wouldn't listen. And you know, God gets sad with us. Right before the flood, he was grieved that he even made man. When he was here in the flesh, as Jesus, right, coming in before Holy Week, right, he stopped on the mountain, he looked down to Jerusalem, went, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you only knew who was coming today. They were going to give him the finger and say, get out of here. And he wept. And then he stood back up and he walked into town and he was hung on a cross. But his people broke his heart. Why? Because he loves. He loves a personal God, not meaning personal like I own him, but personal because he reveals his character and his nature to us, and he loves. And he wants us to love him. You see, then as he would clarify that, he would write this, the Shema out of Deuteronomy. Every, Jew, every Jewish kid knew this. Right, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands that I give to you are, today, are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit down and when you walk along the road. When you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols around your arms and around your foreheads. Put them on your doorposts. Put them around your house. Remember who I am and my commands. And ultimately my, my command that you love me with everything you have. Love. It permeates the whole of his story. So important that this, he says, yeah. Yeah. You want to know how to, how, how to um, counteract not teaching, right? Some parents teach the hate of God because they're disobeying this. Impress upon your children to love me with everything because I have loved them with everything. That this is bedrock foundation of who we are. It's based on his love. And he's adamant about that. Teach your family. Teach your friends. Go out and tell your inner circle that I love them. Because it's a love story. And loving God means obedience. You see, then there was a time when we fast forward through the story, through, you know, flipping through the Old Testament to the New Testament, like Ray was talking about last week, right? Because there was a time when love showed up in the person of Jesus Christ. God in the flesh showed up to show us the extent of the Father's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save it. But whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe remains condemned because they have not believed in God's one and only son. Right? It's what Ray talked about last week. We're, we're born into that situation that we're already declared guilty, but he has a, he has a fix for that, and he, and he has a call that is relentless to come out of the jail cell before it's too late. I've paid the price for you to get out. You can be free, but you have to respond to me, and you have to come. But I so love the world. It's not like, ah, it's a good thing. I might as well go. I love that. I, 
He so loved the world that he gave. Right? Because it's his nature, but it's also the way he works that he gives. And he sacrifices. He so loves the world that, yes, the world being condemned, but he says, I have a get-out-of-jail-free card like you've never imagined. And as I was thinking about that, right, it's God's work. It's his love is his central theme. It's, it's, the, it's the motivation for his work of salvation. Because he wants the whole world to come to know him. Right? Peter would write um, in 2 Peter 3, I think it is, right? That it, why is he so slow in coming back? His slow is not like our slowness. His slow is his patience because he doesn't want people to perish. Because he so loved the world. He wants to fill up the room, right? That's what Jesus would say when he invite, you know, give the parable, like these people that were come, supposed to come to the banquet and they wouldn't come. He's like, well, I got an awesome table. Like, go to the highways and byways, get this place filled because I want a full house. When I was a kid, we would play baseball. We played baseball during Little League time, and then we played baseball after Little League time. And there was a school by my house that um, back in the day, like when you were 10, 12, 14, you could ride a bike anywhere for miles on end with your baseball bat and nothing would happen to you, right? So we would show up at John Muir um, Junior High and with a bunch of guys to play baseball. Sometimes we wouldn't have enough to have two full teams. And so what would we would do? We would close right field. In right field, if you hit out there, you're out automatically. It means no second baseman. Sometimes a, a, first ba- a first baseman to throw it to, otherwise pitcher. But we, you know, right? Because no, at that time, like right, if you're right-handed, no one knew how to, how to go inside out and hit it to opposite field. Like we're just lucky if we hit it, you know, straight to left field. Um, and, and so it felt real. But those days that we had enough people to have two full teams and right field was open, I loved it. It was legitimate. And then there weren't enough people in a closed right field. I would learn to hit opposite field later on when we had a full team. But I think about that with God. God so loved the whole field that he gave and he wants it filled. And so he waits this day of salvation because this day will end. But for now, it's still open. And so we love our inner circle because he so loved us. You see, Jesus one time when he was here, he was put to the test on many occasions. And on this one, someone came up to him and said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Like, do you know? Because you didn't go to our schools. It's a pop quiz. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And... The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. Another time, he, he would have the same question, and the, the person wanting to think, you know, he was going to get an extra credit. He's like, oh, and who is my neighbor? Huh, do you know that question? He's like, yeah. I'll tell you a story. This guy gets robbed. This, this priest comes by, sees him, goes on the other side. A Levite comes by, sees him, goes on the other side. A Samaritan, a half-breed. A less than these comes upon him, puts him on his donkey, brings him to town, pays the innkeeper, says, here's my credit card number. If there's more, charge it. I'll be back. Take care of him. He's like, that's your neighbor. Love your neighbor. People different from you, our inner circle. I think about that. There was a time, one time, it was a dark and stormy night. My wife was at work. I had to provide a meal for the kids. (laughs) McDonald's! So we have McDonald's Happy Meal, right? Because I'm going to provide them a meal. I want them to be happy, right? So we go to McDonald's, not drive through. We're going to sit down and have quality time together. And we're eating. And I see this guy come in the back door and sit down cold and wet. And he wasn't going to eat. I knew it. So we finished our meal. And my girls, stay right here. Daddy, be right back. Where are you going? Oh, hold on. And I go up and I order my meal. Not a happy meal. Like I wanted like a legitimate meal. Because this guy, I don't know when he ate last. And so I got the meal. And they're looking at me like, huh, Dad must be really hungry. And I walked up to this stranger and handed him a meal. I'm like, you're not going to eat tonight, are you? He's like, no. I'm like, now you are. And then my girls were watching. He's breaking all kinds of rules. Don't talk to strangers. What is he doing? What is he doing? Okay, he's okay. 
We got in the car and drive away. And then as soon as we got in the car, it was safe. They're like, what did you do? Did you know that guy? Why did you do that? How did you know? What did you say? Like it was, how did you know he wasn't going to eat? Call it a hunch. What's a hunch? Uh, see me in 10 years, right? But I was loving my neighbor. This person that was around me that was in need. And I was also making it a teachable moment, right? Sometimes I like efficiency. Kill two birds at one stone. It's awesome. And then the night that he was betrayed, he, he said something ironic or funny or what? He says, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you follow me. Like, wait a minute, that sounds kind of redundant. We already have to love God with everything and to love your neighbor as yourself. But see, what's taking place here with this new command is he was about to instill the body of Christ. By going on the cross, he was about to make a people that were never a people before. And he said, and for these people, my body, my church, my bride, you will love each other as well. It permeates everything. We love God with everything, right? The first, first installment of the, test, of the testament, you love, every, you love your neighbor and now love, love one another. And you do so so that people will be like, hey, look how they get along. Must be something about them. Huh. And then you have that conversation with your inner circle. Later that, that day or that night, Jesus would say this, that anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. And my Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. For anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. You see, Jesus was the perfect example, not only of God's love, but of being obedient to God. Because what the Father asked him to do as the Son, he was faithful to do. Even after this, when he would be in the garden and he was asking his dad, like, are you sure there's no other option? I'll do it. Right? But he said, anybody who, who loves me will obey. See, obedient is that closely tied to love. In fact, I think that that's how we show our love for God, with how we treat other people. Like, it's one thing to say, I love you, God, I love you, God, I love you, God. Like, that's fine, I know, I can see your heart, but now show me. Like, what am I going to do? I mean, we give him money, so to speak, right? But no, he's like, yeah, hey, you know what? Here, here's what you do, son. Love other people, and by the way you love them, then I know you love me. And if it's been too long since you've been loving anybody... We need to have a conversation because you said you love me and the way you show your love to me is by loving other people. Gotcha. And this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid his life down for us and we ought to lay our lives down for our brothers and sisters to set it aside. It's Philippians 2, right? He, he did not have the quality of God something to be grasped, but he laid it aside. And when he was asked, he laid down his life. He set it aside. He would pick it back up because he was God. But he said, hey, put other people first. Love your neighbor. If you see that they have material needs, help them out. If you see that they need an encouraging word, give an encouraging word, but don't stop there. It says, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. That in the... Um, Brackets there, that's the, uh, the message translation, which I like. Not just mere talk, right? Just not just with talk. Talk is important how we speak to one another, but how are we going to act toward each other based on our speech? And this is his command. It starts with this. It starts with believing, with receiving what he has done, what God has done in the person of Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he's commanded. For the one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how he knows he lives in us. He gave us his spirit. And, I, and this is where I'm going to end. I'm going to share a little bit more of my story. But I love this verse because it ties in last week of the with, with or when I spoke last time, with with and love. The God's member, he's not going to leave us as an orphan. He says, I'm going to empower you to do this. 
I'm not going to leave you alone to do this. I will reside inside of you. You see there, if I could preach on the forgiveness, and I might bite into our corporate prayer time to, to share this, but um, when I came back to, to Christ after my sabbatical, <laughs> my college years, um, I was being discipled, and I had to come up with, I came up with a very long list of people that I had um, stepped on their toes. <laughs> and at the top of that list was my grandfather, which I made right, and the top of that neck, and it was tied A and B, my parents. Because I had to own my anger and rebellion from that Kentucky Fried Chicken story I told. And so I asked them one time, hey, can we gather around the kitchen table real quick? I, I need to talk to you. Sure. And I proceeded to humble myself and ask their forgiveness and, and, and talk about how I blew my end of the responsibility and how it impacted me. And I asked for their forgiveness. And then there was a long pause, which made me nervous as time kept going. It was more than pregnant. I mean, we have a whole litter of something's coming out, right? I was very pregnant. And my dad said, so, yes, but I, I need to tell you my story. Storytelling. You see, I grew up in a not very good, you don't know my story, son. I grew up in a not very good environment. And when I was a young boy, you know, grandma and grandpa got divorced. And so the five of us boys went to live with my dad. And we moved from the East Bay to the peninsula. See, there were times I lived in a mobile army hospital tent in the backyard of the house that my gra your grandmother was a maid in. She was the housekeeper. And then when I lived with your grandfather, we, we lived in what would essentially be, be a broken down barn. It was full of bat feces where a policeman would come around and do not nice things to my youngest brother. And I swore that if I ever had a, had a, a family and I ever got married, I would provide a house so safe that nothing would happen because it happened to my family. Was, so yeah, did, did we spend more time at work that, that I should have? Yes, and I'm sorry for that, but come hell or high water, I was going to provide a safe place for you and your brother, and I'm sorry. You know, when your dad plays a trump card, there's, <laughs> there's not much more than you can do than to get up and hug it out. I didn't know his story. And he shared his story, and then it made more sense. And then since then, the love in our family has been profound because they put God first, and they not only say it, but they show it. God, I thank you for the gift of this day. I thank you for your generous love. You lavish your gifts to your children. And it comes from a heart of love. It comes from mercy without end. And God, as we enter into this corporate time of prayer for a minute, Lord, that you would just, just hear the hearts of your people. And if you have something on your heart, you just want to pray out loud real quick, you can do that. We'll agree with you, and then I'll close.